turn back to that portion of scripture that we read just a few moments ago over in Exodus chapter 15, looking at verses 22 through 27. Now, it's been a while since we've been here in Exodus because two weeks ago was Palm Sunday, and I preached on Messiah the Prince in Palm Sunday out of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, and most people don't know that that is the passage that actually gives the exact date for the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So we studied that back on March 25th, and last week, Resurrection Sunday, the sunrise service was Emmaus in faith in Luke 24, and then at the morning worship, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell out of Psalm 1610, and in the providence of God, it was the two days before that that the Pope denied that there was any hell and said that the bad people just cease to exist. However, the Bible says they continue to exist in torment. And then uh, last time in Exodus was all the way back to March 18th, where we studied Bitter Waters and Sweet, Naomi in the Desert, Part 22, and today we are on Part 23, and that's the passage of Scripture that we read to you just a few moments ago. Now, as you know, we're looking at the ten different times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. We've gotten as far as rebellion test number four, which was actually a replay of test number two, walking by faith for water. Both of those tests relate to water. So to summarize our introduction to Rephidim, the keys that we've already learned through that test at Rephidim. First, Rephidim occurred just before they reached Mount Sinai and received the law, but it's still counted as one of the ten times of rebellion based on the light that they already had. Light concerning who God is and what is his character. Their judgment was not merely based on the law. It was based on light that they already had concerning the nature of the triune God. Paul explains that principle in Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3. Romans chapter 1 deals with the light of nature. The conclusion, all are guilty based on that light alone. Romans 2 deals with the light of conscience. The conclusion at the end of Romans 2 is that all are guilty based on the fact that they know right from wrong inside. Romans 3 deals with the light of special revelation from God, and the conclusion is all are guilty because that clearly reveals who God is and what his character is like. Later points of rebellion in the wilderness wanderings would highlight the law, but these first four rebellions makes it clear that man is, by nature, rebellious, and the law only adds to the condemnation under which man already finds himself. So we should note well, the first points of rebellion were before the law. Nearly half of the reasons God killed the adult Jews in the wilderness occurred before the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Exodus 19.1, in the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mount. So Rephidim is right before we get to Sinai. Therefore, all are guilty. There is no man that has an excuse. Even those who claim, well, but I'm not under the law, they have no excuse. In other words, what we learned in Romans 1 through 3 is just because the law doesn't save you does not mean that the law is bad. Neither creation nor conscience are bad just because they don't save you. In the same way, the law is not bad just because it doesn't save you. However, it does mean that the law produces the greatest level of accountability of man for declaring the nature and character of God and what God requires of man. We learned a second lesson of application from the Exodus, the tests, the failures, not only at Rephidim, but throughout the wilderness wanderings of Israel. Each of the tests was designed to reveal some of the important character qualities of Christ. Since Christ is the one who is Savior and Judge, the events at Rephidim gave us further insight into his character, and Paul makes a point of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, and he's going back to the Exodus, this is where Paul is in 1 Corinthians 10, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, did all eat the same spiritual meat. Now listen to verse 4. Remember, two of the tests, test number 2 and 4, deal with water. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Jesus himself was leading Israel through the wilderness. 
He's the one who provided for them all that they needed during that entire wilderness wandering. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. You're not kidding. If there were only two million, only one in a million made it, Joshua and Caleb, through that time, I think there were closer to six million. But anyway, with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things, now here's the application. No theology is worth its weight unless there is application to us today. These things were our examples. You've got to learn from the wilderness wanderings. To the intent, here's the purpose, that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, and we've talked about that with the Balaam incident as we've been going through the Nicolaitan problem in the book of Revelation. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye. Here's one that is a big one for the churches. Oh my. How the American church is filled with murmurers and complainers. Listen to what he says. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. In case you didn't get it back in verse 6, he says it again. Verse 11. Now, all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. You think, why is he preaching Exodus? Because those things are our examples. We're told that specifically in the New Testament. We're told that this is exactly how we have to avoid sin. Wherefore, you think you're okay? Okay, then pay attention to verse 12 and 13. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You say, well, you know, sometimes I get temptations they are too big for me. The devil made me do it and all those kind of things that were theoretically joke lines. Listen, here's what verse 13 says. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. You will never face a temptation that is not a common temptation. You're not the only person in the world ever to face that. In fact, every person in the world has faced it at some point or another in some form or another. There is no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. But praise God, we have an antidote. Next four words, but God is faithful. You may not be, but he is. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. In other words, the temptation never gets too big for you at your personal level of spiritual maturity. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, not maybe, not what we hope, but will with the temptation also, and God guarantees this, the character of God is at stake here. God will make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now, we don't always take the way of escape, but God does make a way of escape. It's not too big for you, and there is a door out. Sometimes we don't like the door out. Like when you're at concentration camp, the only way out is crawling through the latrines to get outside the, the barbed wire. You know what? You may not like crawling through the latrines, but that's the way out. Make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now, there's practical application for us from Rephidim because Rephidim deals with the problem of being frustrated. I've asked the question before. How many of you in here have ever been frustrated? <laughs> Come on, let's see the hands. Who says they've never been frustrated? We have all been frustrated, right? Okay. Some of you are perpetually frustrated. Remember Rephidim. It was on the very personal test of frustration that Moses lost his privilege of going into the promised land because frustration makes us do and say things that otherwise we wouldn't do or say. We get frustrated. We decide we're going to solve the problem our way. We go to it, and suddenly we're in trouble. Moses lost it. He lost his principle, and he lost his major rewards, even though he would have to lead rebellious Israel for 40 years 
while he personally obeyed everywhere else. One point of frustration got him into that serious trouble. God said, you didn't sanctify me in the eyes of the people. You're not going to enter the promised land. You'll see it, but you won't get to go in. You see, being frustrated, and here's a critical lesson, being frustrated is not an excuse for failure to obey precisely. I know we've all done it. Have you ever vented angry frustration? Or better, when was the last time you vented angry frustration at God or some other human being? Remember the danger. Never forget what incredible things Moses lost in a moment of angry frustration. We see it in Numbers 20, verses 1 and following. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, to the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people that abode there at Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there, and there was no water for the congregation. You can say, well, you know, but I, I was under personal, personal pressure at the time. I mean, I, I had personal... Look, Moses' sister just died when this took place. She just had a funeral when this took place. There was personal pressure on Moses when this took place as well as congregational pressure. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron. God keeps using water to teach them a lesson. God keeps using water to teach them a lesson. That's a basic necessity of life. That's not something superfluous. That's something you can't live without for more than two or three days. They gathered themselves against Moses and Aaron, and the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. They didn't really want to die, but they were going to. And why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, blaming Moses again, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come out of Egypt to bring us out to this evil place? It's no place of seed or figs or vines or pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. Belly ache, 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 belly ache. Have you ever been in a church like that? Yes, you have. You've been here. And for the last 75 years or more, you've heard it. Belly ache, 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 belly ache. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother. Now here's the key phrase. Do you think God's a God of details, of precision? Is every word in the Bible inspired? Every jot, every tittle? Yes? Yes, yes it is. That means God's not just giving us big ideas and general suggestions and we do our own thing based on a general suggestion how we think we ought to interpret it. God expects and demands precision in obedience. Now listen to what God said to Moses. And Moses wasn't paying attention. God said to him, Speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron, so they're both in this together, gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear ye mine rebels! Do you think Moses was tired of these people? Yeah, I think so. Do you think he was mad at these people? Yeah, I think so. Do you think he was under personal stress? His big sister just died? Yeah, I think so. Do you think he was tired of listening to them gripe, especially about water? Yeah, I think so. But listen to what he says. Must we... Now, wait a minute. Who's going to be doing this? Is it Moses? Is it Aaron? Or is it God? Must we... Fetch you water out of this rock. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod, he smote the rock twice. Now, God's a God of mercy. God was going to provide for his children, 
But God wanted Moses to do what he told him to do so that they would really be wowed by the power of God, not by the power of Moses to smack a rock. They'd seen that before. God said to Moses, speak to the rock. He smote the rock twice. The water came out abundantly. The congregation drank their beasts also. And God says to Moses, listen, the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron. He spoke unto them both. Aaron should have grabbed Moses' hand and said, wait a minute, Moses, that's not God, what God told us to do. God speaks to Moses and Aaron because ye believed me not. Do you understand what it means when we disobey in, oh, the not important tiny little things? God doesn't see anything as unimportant insignificant or tiny when he gives his word. God doesn't add padding just so that he can talk longer. God doesn't make it up as he goes along and wonder why he said that. God isn't making a political speech that can be twisted one way or the other. God speaks exactly and precisely and when God gives a command, he expects it to be obeyed exactly and precisely. And if we don't do it, God says, you didn't believe me. What's that about? That's faith. Moses, you thought that it wouldn't work. You thought that, well, I know it worked the other way last time, and I did that, and it worked, so I might as well do that again. No, Moses, that's not what I told you to do. I told you, speak to the rock. But, Lord, they'll think I'm nuts. I'm talking to rocks. You know, have you ever thought that somebody would think you're nuts if you did something that God said that you're supposed to do? God said, speak to the rock, and Moses thought, but, but that's not action. That's not action. i got to give some action. i got to show these people who's boss. Must we bring you forth water out of the rock? Watch me, boys. I'm going to do it. Whack, whack. You believed me not. Second sin. To sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Your actions have consequences in relation to other people. You parents know that. Your children listen to what you do more than what you say. And when they see you disobeying God, you can tell them all you want to obey God and they'll say, but you didn't do it. There's a lesson for us. We have a responsibility of sanctifying God in the eyes of other people by the way in which we live and the way in which we obey. Okay, Moses, you've just been on trial. You've just heard the charges. There is no defense. Here is the sentence of the judge. Therefore, because of two things, you didn't believe me. Number two, you didn't sanctify me in the eyes of the people. Therefore, ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Remember that the next time you're tempted to be frustrated. Remember that the next time that you think I need to take a course in anger management. Remember that the next time you decide you're going to do it your way because you think your way works, even though you know God said to do it a different way. Moses wasn't deaf. That wasn't his complaint when he stood before God and God said, go down to Egypt and talk to Pharaoh. He said, I stutter. There's a problem with his mouth. And God said, Moses, who made your mouth? Moses couldn't use an excuse about, well, God, I don't hear very well. You know, I need a hearing aid. We never see anything like that in the text. And besides, God would have said to him, Moses, who made your ears? 
This is the water of Meribah, where because the children of Israel strove with the Lord and he was sanctified in them. Now, we talked about the waters of Rephidim. Israel forgotten once again that God could do a lot of things with water. God drew Israel's attention to water and he draws our attention to water in at least eight different ways in the Bible. Summarize quickly, number one, God obviously missed God's point about water at the Red Sea because he shoved huge amount of water out of the way so they could cross. Just remember the principle, God can move huge amount of waters if it needs to be moved for his people. In other words, no obstacle is too big for God to move out of the way for your benefit. Number two, God used water to kill Egyptians. In other words, God can also use water to kill people if he wants to. Water is not pointed like a spear or hard like a sledgehammer. It's soft and comfortable. It can be cooled or heated for our pleasure. We drink it. The principle, God can use even soft, comfortable things to kill his enemies, things they would normally enjoy like food, water, sex, leisure, money, temporal items of the world because he uses these very things to kill them when they break his rules in all of those areas. And we have illustrations of every one of those things in scripture. Think about food. You think about the quails that fell down, they ate it, and while it was in their mouths, they died. They were busy having fun. You think of sex, you think of that instance with Balaam and the Moabitish women, the Midianitish women coming into the camp and God killed 24,000 of them. God doesn't put up with that. Israel also missed the point at Mara where the water was bitter. The lesson, God can change water when he wants to for any purpose he desires. That's the point Jesus made at his very first miracle in Cana of Galilee when he changed the water to wine. The principle, God can turn a crisis situation into a time of blessing and human joy. Fourth thing we learn about water, Rephidim was where Moses struck the rock producing water. See that Exodus 17 and Exodus 19. In other words, God can make water show up anywhere he wants it to show up. Principle, God can do anything. When the sky is brass and you're surrounded by dirty, dry rocks, remember God can and will provide no matter what situation you have in life. Number fifth, we covered these, and I'm just going over them quickly. I believe that God wants us to know he thinks water is important. 70% of the earth's surface is covered with water. That's a lot of water, folks. And when God does something a lot of, he wants us to pay attention to it. That is, it contains more visible life forms than dry land, the principle. When God does a lot of something, it's a wake-up call to open your eyes and see what he's trying to teach you. Number six, there was another time that God moved more water than he did at the Red Sea. God used water to kill the entire world in the days of Noah and the Great Flood. God used water to give us a sign there's a future judgment coming, a judgment by fire. Peter makes that clear when... He compares the flood of Noah to the coming fury of God when the heavens and the earth are consumed by flaming fire, the principle. God gives undeniably visible and overwhelming reminders that he will certainly judge sin and rebellion, which is what he's doing in the wilderness wanderings, which are given as our examples. Number seven, water particles are also what composes the rainbow, God's symbol of beauty, mercy, and grace given to man after the judgment by the great flood, principle, even in judgment, God is still a God of mercy and a God of grace. Number eight, Jesus also made it clear that water is one of the principal symbols for the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. John chapter 7, verses 37 and following. In that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. That's striking in light of all the other major issues and references to water in the Bible, because it draws us to the fact that God, the Holy Spirit, is not only refreshing, but he is also immensely powerful, both in judgment and in grace. But there's more. The Holy Spirit is also intimately connected to prayer and spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now listen to verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in 
the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now let me tell you why that is shockingly significant. Rephidim, which is this place that we've just been talking about where Moses struck the rock and all this whole stuff was going on. Rephidim is about warfare and prayer. It was at Rephidim that Israel fought the Amalekites, while Aaron and Hur supported Moses' hands in prayer as Joshua won a great victory over Amalek. That's Exodus 17, verses 8 through 16. We learn multiple principles of prayer from Rephidim as well. That's the event that gives us a physical illustration of the exhortation by the Apostle Paul regarding the spiritual warfare that we've just read in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Look first at Exodus 17, where Rephidim occurred. Compare it with Ephesians 6. In verse 8 it says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. First thing we learn, right off the bat, verse 8. In spiritual warfare, Satan the enemy will attack you no matter what you're doing. But always he will attack you when you are walking by faith and you're in the center of God's will. Verse 9. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. Here's the lesson, the principle of verse 9. As in most warfare, there is a division of assignments. There's a selection of troops. Choose you out men. Those who are sent as frontline warriors, there's a chain of command. There are logistical support that goes on in every battle. That's true in spiritual warfare as well. Verse 10. So Joshua did as Moses had said unto him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now this is a very important principle. This verse lets us understand that every subordinate officer must fulfill his personal role if there's to be victory. Headquarters always has to be kept appraised of what's going on on the battlefield. Verse 11, and there's a lot here. It came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let it down his hand, Amalek prevailed. There's some really cool principles in this verse. Number one. There are always definite and doable steps in securing a victory. The steps here were quite simple. Moses, lift up your hands, Israel wins. Moses, drop your hands, Amalek wins. So, if you want to win, what do you think has to be done? This or this? Everybody that thinks this, do this. Oh, come on. We have a few people out there don't be cowards. Raise your hands. That's right. How many think that victory consists in doing this? And everybody's sitting there. Ha ha ha. You voted the wrong way, folks. There are doable steps in securing a victory. If you leave anything out, remember we're talking about precise obedience. If you leave anything out, you are guaranteed defeat. You are guaranteed defeat. You cannot make up your own rules in spiritual warfare. You simply can't. Lifting up hands is a symbol in Scripture of intercessory prayer before God. With prayer, there is victory. You can't cut it any other way. Without prayer, there is defeat. Now let's make some application. Remember I said, you know, knowing theology is totally worthless if there is no personal application. We all like to know theology. We've all got all those little things, you know, pigeonholed in little cubby holes up in our head here. We know about election. We know about predestination. We know about the sovereignty of God. We know, now the question is, okay, let's find the application. Here's the application. If you get victory through prayer, and if you get defeat through no prayer. When do we have corporate prayer here at this church? It's called Wednesday evening prayer meeting. You need to be here for prayer meeting. 
You can't cut it any other way. You need to be here for prayer meeting. You may personally, you personally, may be the one key to the failure or the success of this church in its spiritual warfare. You may be the one step or key missing in order for this church to move forward. You may be old, you may be middle-aged, you may be young, you may be a teenager, you may be a child, but you are critically important in the spiritual warfare of this church. Remember, if you try to walk by faith, the devil is going to attack you just like Amalek attacked Israel. Verse 17. Oh, here's some incredible principles in verse 17. Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone. I mean, you know, think about it, standing there, hour after hour. Now, some of the charismatics, they've got their shoulders worked out, so they can do like this for hours and hours, you know. And they wave their hands and all that kind of cool stuff. No, it's not so cool. Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. What do we learn for this? Never forget this. Leaders get tired too. Within the last three days, I talked to another pastor who told me he's totally burned out. That he and his wife are going to counseling because he's totally burned out and he doesn't know what to do. He had nobody holding up his hands. Let that sink in. Leaders get tired too. Try holding your own hands up in the air with a heavy stick for an hour. Remember, Moses had the rod of God in his hands. You try it. Get yourself a two-by-four. Hold it over your head. See if you can do it even for one hour. Sometimes a leader needs to sit and rest while still being involved in prayer. But others need to be there to hold up his hands hands also and not only hold them up but Aaron and her needed to hold Moses hands steady it says he held them they held him steady till the going down of the sun note something else out of this verse it was not an instantaneous victory it lasted from early morn until sunset Aaron and her had an all day job to do just like Moses and Joshua had all day jobs to do. It might even have been boring. I mean, can you think of a more boring job? You're sitting there and holding some guy's hand up so it's in the air? I mean, who has ever had that kind of a boring job? You've never had a boring job like that. At least you got to move around and do a couple of things, maybe even just typing. But they were essential. It may have been boring, but it was critical to victory. What boring job has God given you to do in this church and to hold up the hands to support the pastor of this church? Now, let me be very critical and blunt for a moment. I take no regular salary from the church except what has come into the pastor's salary fund. Some of you have never given a nickel to the pastor's salary fund ever since it was started nine years ago. And yet you feel free to criticize me, tell me what I need to do, complain when I do certain things that you don't like, or preach certain ways. Yet you do nothing to hold up my hands. Nothing. Every week in the bulletin, you see how much money came in to the pastor's salary fund. There's always $250 and a few pennies. That $250 comes from one person. When you see $250 and a few pennies, that comes from one person. 
That means that not one other single individual in this church gave a penny to the pastor's salary fund that week. You expected me to work all week and to preach all the messages. You know, that was what it was last week, $250.01 or whatever it was. It's reported on the back of your bulletin every week. How much came in? You think, oh, oh good, we're getting money in the pastor's salary fund. And that's quite a bit of money. Some of you have never given a penny. And I know it, and I know who you are. Remember the lessons here at Rephidim. And remember, it was at that point that God said, first, he said something to Moses, and then he said something to the congregation. All of you aged 20 and over are going to die in the wilderness. Does that have to be the case with this church? You don't like the applications. You like to hear the preaching of the theology, but not the application. Okay. Do you support the pastor of this church? Are you doing it? Nobody's exempt from the spiritual warfare faced by this church. Verse 13. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Now, you know, it's interesting. Joshua got the credit for the victory. But it was actually a team effort. God was not forgetful to record the parts that Aaron and Hur played in the victory. Moses was the commander-in-chief, and Aaron was the high priest, so we would probably expect them to get some credit. But who in the world was Hur? Because of his faithfulness, he was left with Aaron when Aaron was put in charge of the people when Moses ascended Mount Sinai to receive the law. We see that in Exodus 24, 14, where Hur is also mentioned. But he was subordinate and not able to keep Aaron from the sin of making the golden calf. Josephus claims that he was the husband of Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron. But we don't know that for sure. Just remember, even if you're a nobody, God will give you credit if you are a faithful subordinate, even if you're not the leader. Verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. But it's going to be a long war. We find that as we get down to verse 16. Moses built an altar called the name of it, Jehovah Nisi, which means Jehovah is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. They didn't kill all the Amalekites in that battle. They won a victory, but they were going to have war with Amalek from generation to generation. The Amalekites were descended from Amalek, the son of Esau. Now here I'll leave you with this. I think I've mentioned this before, but let me just leave this with you because our time is up. Did you know that the genealogy of the former Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat goes back to Amalek? The research had been done by a man named Dr. Jimmy DeYoung, where he has traced that back. Yes, sir, Arafat. War with Amalek from generation to generation. Well, wish we had more time, because I still have uh, eight more pages of notes. <laughs> but the Lord willing, we'll pick that up next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your word and for its power, for the opportunity that we have to study it, and hearing it to grow thereby. Gracious Father, we thank you that you are a God of love, a God of character, a God of truth, a God of righteousness, a God who expects to be obeyed precisely. You didn't add any extra verbiage in your word just so that there would be filler, just to make the story more interesting. It's there for a purpose. And we know that the purpose, you told us so in 1 Corinthians, that your purpose in recording these things about Israel in their wilderness wanderings was for our benefit, so that we would learn some lessons, so that we wouldn't fall into the same kind of sins and wickedness and disobedience that Israel fell into. Father, we pray for your blessings upon the word as it's gone forth today, that it would not return unto you void, 
but that it would accomplish that which you please and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 603.